Okay, chemists, in this lesson we are going to introduce ourselves to more organometallics, which are exactly what they sound like. They are carbon-containing organic groups uh, attached to a metal. Uh, what they do is they change the polarity of the bond that we're used to seeing, because they come from halides, things like alkyl bromides or chlorides, which are polarized toward the more electronegative halogen. But once you replace that with a metal, or sometimes insert a metal in between, it completely reverses the direction of that polarity. So you end up getting what look like a carbon nucleophile. And that's the point of them. We're making carbon nucleophiles. There are three types of organometallics that we're gonna see a lot. Uh, they are the Grignard reagent, the organomagnesium reagent, G-R-I-G-N-A-R-D, named after a chemist. Uh, and it looks like this. You start with a halide and you insert elemental magnesium in between the carbon-bromine bond. I won't go into how this happens, it's called an oxidative addition. Uh, right next to it is called a lithiate. This also starts with a halide. I'm arbitrarily using an sp3 halide as opposed to an sp2 halide, just to show you that both of those are possible. Uh, a lithiate replaces the bromine with a lithium atom. Notice lithium group one, so a valency of one as opposed to magnesium group two, so a valency of two. That's why in the Grignard you still have the halogen uh, coordinated into the compound, but in the lithiate you don't. Uh, the bromide, where did it go? It actually went with another equivalent of lithium, made a lithium salt. And the third one uh, is called a cuprate. And a cuprate actually starts with a lithiate. So I am using what I just made to make a cuprate. Cuprates are a little bit more mild than Grignards and lithiates. They still are organometallic. It's your organo species, in this case two carbons, attached to a metal. It happens to be a copper. Uh, it's actually two equivalents of the organo species that ends up getting attached to the copper. So how they draw it is they put a pair of parentheses around the organic group, and then it's a, it's a uh, copper anion. That's why it's called a cuprate. So there is a positively charged lithium right next to it. That might look a little strange, but I'll show you what it looks like. It's sort of like two ethyl groups attached to a copper. There is a negative charge on the copper, and then to coordinate to it, a positively charged lithium. What these things all have in common is that they behave like carbanions. These are carbon nucleophiles. Carbon nucleophiles. So this is just how we make them. But the point of this is if you see one, you think of it as if it's a negative charge on the carbon attached to the metal. So this first one, this Grignard reagent, that's a vinyl group. That's a two carbon alkene attached to a metal. So I think of it as if it's a vinyl anion. When I see vinyl Grignard, I'm thinking vinyl anion. Right next to it, when I see uh, ethyl lithiate, I'm thinking as if I have an ethyl anion. That's how these things will react for us. And even the cuprate, I know it looks a little strange with two of them in a, in a pair of parentheses, but it still only behaves as, as one, you just have twice as many. So ethyl cuprate, or what they would call diethyl cuprate, it just behaves as an ethyl anion. And we're pretty unrestricted in what we can use in terms of hydrocarbons to make organometallics. You can't carry other functional groups in these, but as long as it's just a hydrocarbon, so you've got an alkane or an alkene, you can take one of those, and if you used to have a halogen, it can become an organometallic. So, now let's look at how we use them. The main way is we use them to make alcohols, and we react them with other functional groups like aldehydes, ketones, and epoxides. These are actually very similar to the one organometallic you have already seen, and we just reviewed it in the previous lesson. It was the alkyne anion. In fact, I will put that right in between up here. Recall, if you have an alkyne that's terminal, and you treat it with NaNH2, 
That's enough to deprotonate that terminal alkyne hydrogen, and you get an anion right on the carbon. This was really specific for terminal alkynes. So what if I want something that's not carrying an alkyne and it's you know at the end of an alkene chain or an alkane chain? Well, then I can use something like a Grignard, a lithiate, or a cuprate. So, but it behaves the same way. So we're going to see a lot of similarities in the reactions today to what we saw with these alkyne anions. All right, so first up, let's look at addition to aldehydes. This first one is actually addition to the simplest of all aldehydes, formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is the specific one carbon group. So uh, what I would get is I look at this, this is ethyl Grignard, and I'm picturing as if I have a negative charge right on the carbon attached to the metal. That would act as a nucleophile and attack the carbonyl carbon. The electrons would go up. So I'll actually draw my intermediate. So I would have an oxygen anion and two new carbons directly attached to what used to be the formaldehyde carbon. Then there's what's called an aqueous workup, and that involves the oxygen anion protonating. So you get a primary alcohol. So Grignard plus formaldehyde is one way to make specifically a primary alcohol. And I can bring in as many carbons as I want. They all came from the Grignard, and that means they came from some halide. And you know how to make halides addition to alkenes, radical halogenation, just to name a few. What about addition to a generic aldehyde? That's what the next one is. Addition to aldehydes. This is going to be really similar. An arrow from the organometallic carbon to the carbonyl carbon. You get an oxygen anion. I'm also using ethyl Grignard but the organometallics up above all behave the same way. And then when I throw in H+, I get an alcohol. The only difference between this and the first one, this is a secondary alcohol. How about the next one? What do we have here? We have a ketone. Still using ethyl Grignard as an example. So draw an arrow from the carbon attached to the magnesium to the carbonyl carbon. Send those electrons up. Now what do I have here? I have four carbons. One, two, and then three, four. Now I have an oxygen anion, and I have two extra carbons attached to that, so there's two others. And then protonation of that oxygen anion. You always need this aqueous workup step. So when you use a ketone, you don't get a primary alcohol, you don't get a secondary alcohol, you get a tertiary alcohol. Okay, those three are almost exactly the same transformation. We're just changing how substituted the carbonyl is. Formaldehyde, an aldehyde, and a ketone. But the arrow pushing is identical for all of them. And even though I'm using a Grignard as an example, the organomagnesium reagent, the organolithiate behaves exactly the same way. In fact, I'll make a note of that up here. Lithiates and, organ and uh, Grignards behave the same, react the same. The one that's a little different is cuprates. So we'll, we'll come back to cuprates in a little bit when we see how they react a little differently. Anyway, onward, what about groups that are not aldehyde or ketone based? That gets us to an epoxide. Uh, so what does an addition to an epoxide look like if I have a Grignard? Well, think about the alkyne anion. Alkyne anions, we saw reacting with epoxides, they're basic because they're anionic. So they're going to attack the less substituted side of the epoxide. So I draw an arrow from the carbon attached to the magnesium to the less substituted carbon of the epoxide. The CO bond breaks. You get a new two-carbon group attached there. And then I have an oxygen anion on the carbon that used to be part of the epoxide. Notice there's no change in the stereochemistry at that particular carbon, so I don't change anything about the stereochemistry there. What would happen next is it would protonate, 
get your alcohol this one happens to be secondary but depending on what the substitution of the epoxide is you can get frankly all kinds of alcohols primary secondary or tertiary just change how substituted the epoxide is okay now the map changes a little bit for the last three that we're going to learn about today this is an acid chloride uh, we have not yet learned about acid chlorides and this is frankly the first time we've seen them but i'm going to show it to you anyway because it's a useful distinction between this and other carbonyl functionalities in addition to acid chlorides if I had to guess what happens, I would draw the same thing I drew before, an arrow from the carbon attached to the magnesium to the carbonyl carbon. And the carbonyl still absorbs those electrons. Oxygen is the second most electronegative element on the table. So I get what looks exactly like what we have up above. The difference is because this is an acid chloride, I have a good chlorine leaving group. So that oxygen anion that I just made it doesn't go pick up the H+. Instead, it comes back down to reform the carbonyl, and the chloride leaves. Notice it doesn't happen right away in the first step. There is an addition uh, that occurs so that the carbonyl absorbs that pair of electrons. Remember, a carbonyl is just a CO double bond. That's what we mean when we say that. So you get an intermediate that looks like this after the chloride leaves. What functional group is that? That's a ketone. And Grignards react with ketones, so you get a second addition. You cannot stop this from happening. This is called over-addition, and it's impossible to stop. But maybe it's what you want. Now we have a second equivalent of the same Grignard attacking ketone. And I get to the oxygen anion, and that's what sits around waiting for your aqueous workup to come in, and you get a tertiary alcohol. So acid chlorides plus Grignards will always give you a tertiary alcohol. You can't stop it. In fact, there's other derivatives of these carbonyl compounds that we'll learn more about in the spring semester of this class. The acid chloride is one of them. The one right below that behaves exactly the same way. This is an ester. We don't really know how to make esters yet, but if we're given one, we can add a Grignard to an ester, and you get almost the same thing as before. I'll actually show the mechanism of this a little bit. It's worth highlighting. How does it start? The organomagnesium attacks the carbonyl carbon. The electrons go up. You get an oxygen anion, two new carbons from the Grignard, and an OR group, whatever was originally on the ester. And just like we saw in the acid chloride, you reform the carbonyl, and that OR group leaves. OR, alkoxide, terrible leaving group. But under the conditions of a Grignard addition or any organometallic, it's so basic that you actually can expel that alkoxide as if it was a leaving group. But then like before, or right above I should say, a second Grignard attacks the intermediate ketone. You get an oxygen anion, and this protonates. tertiary alcohol. The only reason I point this one out differently than the acid chloride is esters are a little milder than acid chlorides. They're sort of easier to work with. Uh, and you also have this, this other OR group. So what's that thing doing? Well, actually, it's sitting around waiting for you this whole time. So we've actually had this OR group the whole time. And when it sees the H+, I guess it's actually in the previous step, it also will pick up an H+, because aqueous workups are almost always with excess acid. So you get two alcohols for the price of one ester. You get another alcohol, it's whatever used to be attached to the ester. So let's say, just to throw one more at us, I have something like an acid chloride or an ester, and I don't want to do over addition. This is the only example where I'm going to use a cuprate, and it's to highlight the fact that cuprates are less reactive than the other two. So this is addition of a cuprate in an acid chloride. 
coop rates turn out to be milder than Grignard's or Lafayette's. So here is an example of where you would imagine you have a negatively charged carbon attached to the copper. So I get the same type of mechanism that I saw two lines up above, and I reform the carbonyl and kick out the chloride, and indeed I get my ketone, but this is actually your product. Addition stops at the ketone. Addition stops at ketone. And that's simply because cuprates don't react with ketones, or at least not these types of ketones. We'll see some others in the next semester of the course. Okay, so those are a lot of different addition reactions. That looks like a whole bunch of new reactions, but I hope you'll understand they all follow the same pattern where we have a nucleophilic carbon attached to a metal, and it can add to any of these electrophilic things, aldehydes, ketones, epoxides, even some functional groups we haven't seen yet, like ascaparides and esters. And we can make them from any alkyl halide. I put a little note in the bottom there that highlights they can contain alkyl, aryl, meaning aromatic rings, benzene rings, alkenes, alkynes, but really no other functional group. You can't make a Grignard out of something that already has an alcohol or a ketone or something else already in that molecule. And that's because Grignards, Lithiates, and Cuprates are normally so reactive, they would react with the molecule itself instead of just forming the reagent. So hydrocarbon only. Hydrocarbon only. It's got to have a halide in it to do that substitution, but that's what you can carry. Okay, that's a quick introduction to organometallics. We're going to use them for the bulk of the year.